Welcome to level three. Um, we've got a very interesting discussion this afternoon. Uh, Hanno Stegman, who's the uh, CEO of, I'm calling it Rocket Internet Asia, but he's going to tell you why that's not exactly the correct description, um, but that's okay. Uh, for many of you, I think you're very familiar with Rocket. Uh, obviously, the Lazada experience and, the, and their great return, 20 times uh, return on investment uh, with Lazada is a pretty ex exciting return. Uh, and uh, they, of course, again, many of you would know, all about sort of picking great business models, great verticals, and uh, building very interesting organizations. And there has been some controversy about them over the years, about how they go about things. Uh, and I'm going to ask a few, not too difficult questions, but a few questions about that and how things operate. Uh, and you'll also get a chance uh, to ask questions of Hanno. He's going to give us a presentation talking about some of their strategies, what they're doing, what they're doing currently. Uh, and that, that's going to go for about uh, tw 20, 25 minutes. Then we'll, I'll do some questions and then over to you folks to ask questions. Um, Hanno's no stranger to Singapore. He's been in and out of Singapore for you know, umpteen years. I'm going to say about uh, anywhere between six and eight years. He's uh, been running Rocket for the last three years. He did his MBA at INSEAD here. Uh, also other studies. He's been backwards and forwards. So has a real affinity uh, and understanding of Singapore. So I would like to uh, give a warm welcome to Hanno. Thank you and much appreciated. Thanks for having me. Um, and as I said, let's, um, or as introduced, let's uh, try to do it as interactive as possible. So I will, uh, you know, do a first a very brief presentation, perhaps 20 minutes, just to run you uh, through our activities in Asia, a bit um, intro what, what, what Rocket is or how our Asia fund is called Asia Pacific Internet Group. So what are we all about? Um, I would like to highlight especially a couple of the ac activities we do in the emerging markets, in the next generation of markets in, in e-commerce at the moment, something where uh, we are very excited about and we are very proud of. And then let's yeah, uh, go to a conversation, Q&A, happy to, to get your thoughts, your questions, your comments. Um, and uh, you know, it's always be uh, very good to be at an interesting uh, place at an interesting, uh, uh, with an interesting audience. So happy to be at level three to, uh, today. So uh, thanks for the invitation again. Um, What's our mission as, as Asia Pacific Internet Group or, or Rocket? What are we all about? And uh, you know, I think that's something that was already mentioned. So we are a company incubator. We look for business models for verticals where we can, we, we believe these can be the next unicorns, the next big, big verticals, the next successful companies. And then we look for the best talent, for the best people to help us to build uh, those exciting companies. Um, and while doing that, we of course try to leverage um, our experience, our resources, our knowledge to ensure we don't do similar mistakes. So we try to be as structured as possible uh, in the whole space of company building. Um, and that's very much um, of, of, of our DNA. Doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes, uh, but we try to avoid at least to make mistakes uh, repeatedly uh, and try to learn from wh what we uh, what we experience by building companies all around the world. Um, and that's also what Asia Internet Group is all about. So I think in the introduction it was said, is it Rocket Asia or is it something else? So it is Rocket Asia, but we are partnering uh, with other strategic investors and that's why we formed an independent group where Rocket is an important uh, shareholder and stakeholder, of course, but uh, we also have some other investors, some of the large telcos uh, in Indonesia and the Philippines and Myanmar um, decided to go on this journey together with us. So uh, Rocket, in a nutshell, uh, you know, existed till 2007, IPO'd on the German stock exchange, uh, set up many, many different companies around the world. A lot of people, finally, in Europe always think it's a European company. In Asia, a lot of people hopefully still know our um, Asian companies like Food Panda, like Zalora, like Lazada, um, and in Europe, uh, most people know our, our European companies. I think. Um, Overall, um, we have been building companies very, very successfully. Um, I just uh, came back from some meetings in Berlin. There were statistics around the last, whatever, 
15 IPOs that were done uh, on the German stock exchange and over 60% of those were uh, rocket companies. So Lazada, of course, a big uh, success story after our exit to Alibaba. We just IPO'd HelloFresh uh, for a valuation of nearly uh, 1.6 billion. Uh, we IPO'd Food Panda uh, as part of the Delivery Hero group. Um, so we just did two kind of unicorn IPOs this year. Um, Rocket itself, um, of course, our initial e-commerce company in Germany, Zalando. So many, many different uh, successes. But of course, we're also building a lot of companies. And when you build some companies, something also should go 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 well. Um, and some companies, of course, we also close when we see the traction is not as we expect and the, the success is not uh, as we uh, expect. Um, what a lot of people don't know is our big focus on um, international presence and on being basically everywhere in the world. Um, one of our strengths, I believe, was always and is still to try to be a pioneer in markets where other ventures, other investors uh, don't go. So when you think about it, Amazon is only active in a handful, or perhaps now in two handful of countries, but out of whatever 260 countries in the world, it's only 10 countries. Um, it doesn't mean that we uh, invent e-commerce um, or we have invented e-commerce or they have invented e-commerce, but it's definitely something very different and something very, uh, also a very different challenge to build a successful company in doing e-commerce in Indonesia than to do it in the US or in Germany or somewhere else. So I think our, our international scale is something where we are very proud of, um, uh, especially when it comes to e emerging markets. A business model, um, uh, let's say, is relatively simple, but of course, in the end, the devil is always in the detail, or the art is in the detail. The detail. So it's about identification of the business models we like, um, and we think are proven. Happy to discuss that a bit further, but for that means it's something a business model where we think the fundamental economics work. We have. Uh, sufficient evidence that it can scale in certain markets. Um, we have sufficient comfort that we master core elements of the business model and the value chain, and we can roll it out. And then, of course, it's all about the opportunity to scale it in markets where a competitive environment is attractive, where we're not the sixth kid on the block, but perhaps we are the pioneer or the new kid on the block, uh, where you can really also deliver a difference. Um, to, to, to customers and to, uh, to the value proposition that already exists in a market. Um, then it's about building, and building for us, it's all about execution, about processes, about sharing learnings, sh sharing platforms, sharing knowledge to um, you know, scale something then um, as fast as, as, as possible, connect with our partners, connect with our, our ecosystem of partners we have, let it be investors, let it be um, uh, you know, companies we work with, let it be connect them with our own companies and our own funder, uh, founders to create a bit of an internal ecosystem to be as successful as possible. And then at some point, um, of course, our idea is uh, to, to exit, to IPO, to sell successful companies because in the, in the very kind of long uh, and big picture, we are, of course, a financial investor. Um, uh, you know, we are measured against uh, returns we deliver. Um, unlike a VC, we start way earlier, and I would also argue we take much more risk uh, than a classical VC. Um, depending perhaps on the stage where the, uh, where the VC invests. Um, but in the end, that's the, the KPI for me, the KPI for us as a company to deliver returns uh, to our shareholders. Um, so all about execution and about speed, not so much about the idea. And that is one of the very contro controversial elements or something, or something that is um, always discussed to say, oh, Rocket, uh, you know, you guys are only copying business models. Uh, you're just um, um, looking at what other people are doing and replicating it. And, and I'm not saying that this is not entirely true because we are looking at what is already working somewhere else. And I'm also not telling you that we have invented e-commerce and the lot Lazada was uh, the most innovative business model uh, that we came up with. But of course, we looked at uh, what other successful e-commerce companies are doing um, and what they do well and what they perhaps don't do so well. But then it's about the innovation 
on the local market and about the execution in the local market. And I would still argue, and I hope we will also see it um, ourselves, that running an e-commerce company in the US, it's very different from running it successful in Indonesia. And let's see how well also a company like Amazon will do it uh, in Indonesia. And uh, I think the degree of innovation of our businesses and the uh, degree of really making a difference is in the execution that doesn't really make us uh, just a stupid copy-paste uh, company, but rather makes us a company, uh, company that just focuses on other elements on the value chain um, and just captures opportunities that we still believe are there. And there are still plenty of opportunities and there are plenty of opportunities uh, if you look also um, across the typical markets where most investors focus on at the moment, uh, let it be Indonesia, we are looking at Myanmar, we are looking at Pakistan, we are looking at Bangladesh and happy to tell you a bit more about that. So regional presence of our group um, all over Southeast Asia. So uh, we are covering with a headquarter and a base in Singapore all large consumer markets. Um, you know, we started, as I said, very much with the, with the, with Singapore as a hub. Also, Singapore is an excellent place to try out things on a smaller scale and a bit of a protected environment. But of course, interesting for us are the large consumer markets. That's why I spend now a lot of time also in Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. Uh, 500 million people uh, only in those three uh, countries. Uh, a lot of people and investors very scared about doing business there. And that's exactly an opportunity where we want to kind of tap our foot into and build the next uh, interesting company. So the countries and offices are already mentioned. A couple of the verticals we are operating here in Southeast Asia um, is still e-commerce. So I'll tell you more about our, uh, basically our next Lazada uh, called Daras. Uh, we are uh, having uh, big online classified companies here. So sell your car, sell your house, find a job. Um, La Moody, Car Moody, Ever Jobs. Uh, we are operating a very innovative hotel a platform called Zen Rooms. So whenever you travel to um, any um, Asian market at the moment, you look for a decent but very competitively priced two, three star hotel where there's no um, you know, well-known hotel chain in that space. Zen Rooms uh, is the uh, uh, solution for that. Um, we are uh, just launched this year um, a staffing platform for shift jobs called U-Shift. So when, uh, say, Starbucks needs somebody just to work for two hours, to help for two hours, help for an event, replace somebody who got sick in the kitchen for, for half a day, U-Shift tries to um, basically match supply and demand uh, for this uh, space of the market. Also something that we saw working extremely well in the US and we thought, okay, come on, in, in Asia, there are so many people working on shift kind of jobs, part-time jobs. Uh, there must be an opportunity to disrupt the classical job staffing agency here. So a lot of new things we are also doing. Uh, also, uh, apart from uh, the big verticals, apart from uh, e-commerce, trying out something in Singapore. And then we have, uh, because I have uh, Philip, one of our founders here as well, we have Helpling in Singapore. Um, I don't know whether you used uh, Helpling already. It's a platform that we also uh, rolled out uh, on a global basis now, where you can find a cleaner, um, yeah, to, to, to clean your house, to help you in the household with different activities on a very convenient uh, basis without having to go to an agency, without uh, having to employ a full-term helper or, which is also an issue in a lot of countries, without going to basically the gray market where you pay somebody in cash without having insurance, without having social security for the person. So uh, I think a lot of elements where we think there's still potential for disruption, for innovation, and where we can build uh, interesting companies, and we are doing that. Um, why is Asia so important for us? And why is Asia so important, especially for, for, for Rocket? It's just about um, the fundamentals of the markets that we like, and that's especially also why we like the emerging countries so much. Um, I think most of you all know that, but of course, just the sheer, sheer size of the markets is important for us. Uh, growth, if you look at um, market penetration of smartphones uh, in Myanmar, you still see uh, crazy growth every month. Um, you have solid GDP outlooks, sometimes a bit bumpy, but we are not uh, short-term and uh, you know, short-term oriented investor. We are somebody who looks at a five, 10 year uh, horizon, and that's why GDP outlook, uh, we are very bullish about that. Um, we see basically every month, every week, every day, 
the infrastructure is improving, we see new payment providers coming up, we see suddenly places where we could never deliver a parcel to, uh, that small logistic providers are popping up, that we are helping the ecosystem to develop by also building our own logistic and then partnering uh, with um, local partners to, to enable logistic and to enable delivery to some remote areas. Um, and of course, there are a lot of consumer needs, and that is an important point, especially for the uh, emerging markets, that are still not fulfilled. So uh, very important that you uh, also forget a bit of your Singapore mindset sometimes and think about you know, living, let's say, in Karachi, where uh, traffic is still terrible, where there may only be one or two malls uh, that carry certain products uh, and for you it's a very big it's not only convenience and price like in singapore but it's perhaps the only opportunity for you to s buy and to shop certain goods to do it online and that's why uh, that's also why the value proposition is a very different one and can be a very different one and that's something we we try to leverage uh, heavily on in in the emerging markets to not only positioning us as uh, you know the, the guys for convenience and for you sitting your so so far and get something cheap, delivered fast, but it's a completely new opportunity to buy certain goods that you could, have an, an, you could uh, never have bought before. Um, young generation, I mean, I will skip a bit of the, 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 the slides. There's a brilliant uh, study actually done by Google and Temasek where I uh, took some of the data from. I think it's public, uh, publicly available, uh, available. So uh, a lot of good information, good data points, but still crazy to see um, you know, the young population that is now leapfrogging, uh, never had a computer, will probably never own a desktop computer, but uh, buys a smartphone, is interested in exploring the internet, and exactly for these kind of customer groups, we try to create offers and create companies. Um, market growth, uh, also crazy. Uh, if you look at, at uh, the mature markets, also market like Singapore, everybody has internet access, everybody has uh, smartphones, but in some of those markets, uh, you have uh, crazy growth, growth rates that we can just see every day, also in doing business, that people are coming online, um, that um, they buy smartphones, that some of the Chinese um, manufacturers, for the first time, uh, basically create also the opportunity for the middle class to buy a smartphone, to have internet con connectivity, um, and that of course is um, at least a very good and a very solid foundation to set up a company, because if you set up a company, as we all know, in a growing market, your life is a bit easier than uh, setting up a company that competes in a very, um, you know, in a declining market with a lot of competitors already around. And that's why also you see uh, a reflection of the growth rates uh, of the whole e-commerce market. And this is e-commerce only and doesn't even cover travel, doesn't even cover um, elements like, like uh, a company like Helpling or doesn't e even cover fintech or other opportunities. Just, uh, let's say, boring e-commerce uh, is, is uh, ex expected to grow uh, crazily, driven by both um, fundamentals of the economies, um, population, GDP, but also, of course, by a, a continuous massive shift from offline to online. And those effects combined uh, probably still justify also the high valuations that some uh, investors and strategics are willing to pay when they look at companies, successful e-commerce e companies here in the region. Um, and last but not least, just something that I always like to stress, um, because again, this is not a Singapore statistic, probably Singapore statistic would look even more like North America. The number of people you have in some of the emerging markets per shopping mall is uh, just completely out of range compared to um, other more developed and more advanced economies. And if you would do this statistic for a country like Myanmar or for Bangladesh or Pakistan, it would be even more um, extreme. Uh, and that again, shows the opportunity you have uh, in, in growing uh, in online companies just by fulfilling basic con uh, consumer needs that the people cannot yet fulfill just because of the lack of shopping, physical shopping infrastructure, um, just because of the lack of accessibility to go to certain locations just to buy something. Um, so we are a very strong believer that the shift from offline to online will happen and it will happen everywhere and uh, that's why we're also not shy to go to markets that may uh, you know, seem to be a bit adventurous at this point in time. 
Um, and I think that's also a big advantage we have as, as being Rocket, as being a company that has uh, you know, founder DNA uh, that also has, uh, let's say, the ability to take significant risks. And that's not, let's say, uh, you know, accusing somebody, but of course we all know that some corporate companies um, and more established companies are not able to take certain risks. We believe we are able to uh, take certain risks. And when we started Lazada um, in Indonesia, everybody told us, you guys are completely crazy. How can you do e-commerce in a country where there's no delivery infrastructure, where nobody has a credit card, um, where nobody knows how, st how to use the internet, and m a lot of people don't even have a smartphone. And, and we still said, okay, let's try it. I think we, we, we should do it. Uh, we should be able to do it. Let's roll up our sleeves and, and start. Um, and I think looking back, it was um, uh, quite uh, smart to start so early and to be a pioneer, to be a first mover, instead of waiting uh, until basically the, 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 the marketplace is set. You have uh, delivery companies everywhere. You have a growing payment infrastructure. But then, of course, you also have something which is not so nice, which is massive competition and already some brands uh, that uh, customers like and customers are attached to. So that is why um, we try to repeat at the moment our Lazada uh, success in uh, markets like uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, and Myanmar. Um, difficult markets. Um, when I flew to Karachi and uh, for the first time, um, most of my friends told me, you know, Hannah, are you sure you want to do this? Um, we are not even allowed to fly there um, because of our corporate policy. I think uh, I spoke to th three friends. I mean, I only had a, um, let's say a case study of three. Um, one told me uh, that he's only a allowed to do meetings at the airport because of their corporate travel policy, so he's not allowed to leave Karachi Airport. Uh, the other one was only allowed to fly to Karachi, but not to any other place in Pakistan. And the other one was uh, not f uh, allowed to fly at all to Pakistan because of corporate, uh, corporate policy. And in the end, um, you know, of course, I mean, I'm still alive. I'm s I, I still came back, um, but it's also a fascinating market. And uh, I mean, jokes aside, I think there are definitely uh, uh, risks involved in, in going to some uh, emerging markets, and I'm not the right person to comment on the political situation uh, in, in markets like, like Pakistan or Bangladesh, um, or even uh, some areas of Myanmar at the moment. But um, I think it's important to at least be open for the opportunities to, you know, get your own opinion, form your own, op own opinion in the country on site by speaking uh, to the people. And I was always amazed by, you know, the energy you see when speaking to young entrepreneurs in those countries and all of those countries by the talent that uh, uh, you find there. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, it's much better at least to get an opinion uh, firsthand instead of just reading the horror stories uh, you sometimes uh, read in the news about, uh, you know, in Pakistan only being terrorists. Actually, super, super friendly people, amazing young people, amazing opportunity in the market. And same for Bangladesh and, 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 and Myanmar. Uh, which, well, Myanmar is probably, as, as a lot of us uh, may have gone there as tourists, the most, let's say, accessible uh, of those countries. Um, so, what are the big challenges we discovered when we uh, started to build e-commerce companies uh, there? Of course, infrastructure. Uh, so, infrastructure, uh, a mess. Um, awareness is a huge uh, issue. A awareness means uh, people who buy a smartphone and have, in theory, access to the internet doesn't mean that they know that they can do e-commerce. So in Myanmar, still a big challenge for us is that 80% of the people believe the internet is equal to Facebook. So they don't even know Google, so they search on Facebook for something. So then to try to tell them that they should visit your website and they can actually shop is, um, you know, I don't want to be arrogant and tell it's education, but we in a way, it's a customer education and a process that you need to align your whole marketing and your whole processes um, to fit those market needs uh, to a point where you need to call back customers and explain that they actually made an order and they really get something delivered. Um, some, some, uh, some stories I can tell you about that. Um, fraud, still big, big issue. Also for a lot of people, e-commerce and e-commerce platforms were related to fake goods. Um, 
no standards in place of giving guarantees for authenticity, no return policies, um, even no return policies in the shops. Uh, so a concept completely new also for the entire commerce market, not only the e-commerce market. Talent, um, a big, big topic, where to find an online marketing ma manager who can help you with your online marketing campaign using uh, the Myanmar uh, language, for example. Not so easy. Uh, payment, no, still you know, cash uh, is, is king uh, in most of those countries. And of course, the challenge that we are still thinking very much on a desktop-based uh, way sometimes. And most of those people, as I said, will never own a computer and have never owned a computer. So their first touch point with the internet or you as a company is the mobile phone and you just need to adapt to it. But I think um, um, it can be done and can be, uh, some of those issues can be solved successfully if you just go there and give it a try. So first is creating an own infrastructure for many of those countries there is no third party logistic provider. So you cannot just call UPS or DHL to say, please do this for me. You just need to build your own delivery fleet to an extent where you just need to say, okay, perhaps I need to do a little partnership with the policemen of the little village because they are not real um, uh, addresses. Um, uh, and he's the only one who actually knows who ordered this good and where this guy actually lives. Um, but it's about being creative and solving the problems locally. Um, instead of just waiting until somebody else has solv solved it for you. Uh, increase awareness of a lot of campaigns, a lot of offline activities we are doing, a lot of educational campaigns to teach people uh, how to uh, do uh, commerce online, uh, even you know, having, having our uh, partners and scouts in some rural areas with tablets to show other people how to order, to show them the order process. Uh, but this is the, the thing you need to, you need to do to, to be successful. Fight fraud. I think we were the first ones to really introduce clear policies on return, on guarantees of uh, your authenticity, um, uh, and to explain that also to people that this makes sense and why you do it. Um, talent, we still spend a lot of time on bringing some of our people in the countries to work with the local managers to create uh, real, let's say, local talent and to educate uh, our staff because in the end we want to build local companies and not, lot, not companies run by, by expats. Um, cash on delivery is just something I don't like but we just accept and we need to accept. So in a country like Myanmar, 90% of our orders are cash orders and paid in cash at delivery. We still believe it makes a lot of sense, um, uh, but you need to have then processes in place that at least allow you to do that and to have certain checks and balances that you can deal with cash in your company. And of course, everything catered only on mobile um, and especially also on the local needs of the local mobile users, which could mean that pe some people don't download your app uh, when it's 50 uh, megabyte uh, because they say, oh, come on, it's too expensive, it's too slow, it takes ages, I don't want this. Um, uh, and then you need to perhaps build a leaner app and a, a, an app that's not as fancy uh, to make it available to everyone um, and to uh, you know, even you know, sometimes cut back your design fantasies of having the super nice, sleekest app to accommodate also the, the local taste and the local preference, which is very often that data is still something very precious that you don't want to use. So Lazada, we went through, uh, so I think it was only what is it, 15 times, so not 20 times, but still a very good deal for us. Um, Daraz is our next Lazada, so just a couple of um, thoughts about uh, Daraz. So we are now, uh, you know, number one, e the number one e-commerce company in Pakistan, Myanmar, and Bangladesh, and also uh, rolling out in Sri Lanka and Nepal. Um, we were so early in Myanmar that we actually reserved the domain shop.com, uh, so the first, basically, probably domain in that space that was uh, registered in, in, uh, in, in Myanmar, so everybody knows us uh, under the shop.com brand. Um, you know, we want to be the biggest e-commerce mall for 500 million people in all of those countries, so just the pure number of customers should, at least, let's say for me, as a European person, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a big number, 500 million people. Perhaps some of the uh, Indian and Chinese uh, colleagues still laugh about it, but uh, I think it's a massive opportunity. Um, we are building own delivery in um, 
all of our countries, and that's just an example. We are now, uh, you know, basically building and ramping up our delivery infrastructure um, in Karachi with our own, own warehouses, with own distribution centers, also investing a lot in infrastructure. Just in as, as an example, you know, that we also need to go into that elements and these areas um, if required to be successful, to, to, to build something on the ground, um, uh, you know, that's working and that solves the problems. Um, educate uh, talent, that's just an example of, of some of the initiatives we are doing with our young leadership uh, programs. You know, in the end, it's all about, you know, companies and uh, successful companies are all about the people who work there. Um, so we have a lot of kind of, we invest a lot and we do a lot with educating local, uh, local managers and local people um, to you know, bec become the next leaders of this, uh, those companies. So our big goal is not to have the, the, the experts around in those countries, and that's going extremely well. Um, and of course, create awareness, and you uh, definitely all read about uh, the big singles day where I think Alibaba did 25,000 transactions a second or something like this. Uh, it's something that we will not uh, reach. I think, I think it was uh, two interesting statistics I saw. I think 25,000 transactions a second on sing singles day, and I think it was the GDP of Cambodia in one day just uh, on, on Alibaba uh, a singles day. So, of course, we are not there yet. Uh, but uh, funnily enough, um, we introduced the concept of Black Friday in Pakistan and in Myanmar and also in Bangladesh. Um, I was a bit, uh, you know, um, skeptical at the beginning, I need to say, to say, okay, should we go with such a kind of US-driven marketing approach uh, to those countries? But now everybody is crazy about Black Friday. All the local and offline competitors are doing that as well. And I think... I need to think it's 25th or something, so the, the teams are uh, preparing for that. And, uh, you know, the big Dara's Black Friday is just one example of then the marketing activities you roll out even countrywide and even create something like a countrywide buzz about opportunity to shop online, to, to create an awareness for your, for your companies. So that's just kind of a very brief, I, and I hope it was brief, <laughs> outlook of, of or, or sum summary of the activities uh, we are doing at the moment. Um, so I think um, key takeaways from, 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 from my view and also happy to get your thoughts. Um, I hope you learned a little bit more about let's say, what we aim to do as Rocket with Rocket. Um, we believe very much in the opportunity to be early in markets where others don't go. I think that is still uh, very uh, important for us. Um, and I'm a very big fan of all the opportunities that still lay, lie, lie in front of us, especially when it comes to the emerging markets, especially when it comes to fascinating markets like, like uh, Pakistan, Myanmar, Bangladesh, uh, and some of the, sometimes, um, you know, you should perhaps not go to the markets where everybody is going. Uh, and just because everybody wants to invest in Indonesia at the moment, for example, doesn't mean that you should be the next one also investing, but you should perhaps also look at other opportunities. And that's something where, you know, we, we still believe uh, we, we did uh, very successfully in the past and will hopefully do in the future as well. Thanks so much for your attention and then happy to yep. join the hot, hot chair. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. X marks the spot. Thank you. So actually, I got that 20 times from Bloomberg, actually. Th th they said 20 times, and they're not always so nice. So they've given you a 20 times multiple there. So congratulations. Go with the 20. we told Bloomberg 20 times. Yeah, no, <laughs> they're not very good with their calculators. Uh, so I, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions while you're uh, thinking of some questions you might like to ask, uh, and then I'll hand over to the floor. I, I guess what, one of the things, um, as you say, that... Um, you look for proven business models. And you know, I, I think at times commentators are a bit mean when they say, oh, you know, why are you doing something that's been done before? I mean, I don't think there's a rule book out there that says that you have to be totally uh, from the ground up every time. Why do you think people sort of make those sort of, I, I think, um, you know, criticisms at times? That's a good question. I think, I mean, I mean, first, of course, we also appreciate that there's, in. I mean, how should I best say it? I think, in general, everybody, also, also, I personally have a lot of respect for for intellectual property. Oh, oh yeah, I'm not, not, not is suggesting that. It's no, just no, no. Um, no I'm, I'm just saying. I think 
also in general, I think innovation and real innovation and real intellectual property has a huge value, I think, for everyone. And that's why I think as soon as somebody is using, let's say, not protected intellectual property, uh, there are some people um, you know, uh, who, who don't like that and who are skeptical about it. Yeah. I mean, probably like, um, you know, I'm German, so everybody hated the Japanese for, for being more efficient in creating certain electronic appliances, and everybody now is accusing the Chinese for to, to, to copy certain things. So um, I think there I it's actually not a bad thing that people are asking the question, okay, come on, mm. what's the degree of innovation you really bring? Yep. And are you an inno innovative company, yes or no? So I think it's a it's a healthy criticism in a way, right. uh, but of course then to explain uh, you know a bit further that there are certain levels or different levels of innovation maybe uh, a bit more uh, tricky sometimes. Sure. And, and perhaps just to add on, on this, the, the funny story and it's, it's a bit irony in a way. You know when, when Rocket started, um, you know the, the the founders basically did an eBay kind of model in Germany, and they went to eBay first and told them, oh, we believe there's a great opportunity to do it in Germany. Cannot we do it, uh, can, can we not do it together for eBay? eBay said no. Um, um, afterwards, eBay bought the company, whatever, half a year later for a ridiculously high amount. Um, and then perhaps looking back, um, you know, they even felt, okay, can we even ask them? They said no, <laughs> we made a lot of money with it, so why should we not repeat that? So, Well, exactly, I mean, a great way to learn. Um, as you said, a lot of your success factor is sort of 99% execution, 1% the idea. So given that you, the idea is not so important, perhaps you can give us some insight to how you select the idea, because 99% is execution. Well, what are the sort of the metrics or the tools that you use to select that 1% idea? Um, so we have some assessment frameworks, and of course, in the end, it's also very much based on, on let's say, our, our investment community decisions with a lot of experience, with a lot of people on the table who, who have done and ha have gained experience in different business models. But uh, you know, I think a couple of elements are already mentioned. I think one is we need to be very clear that the basic economics of the business work. Mm -hmm. So so if you just do your very, very simple draft unit economics um, on, on whatever your take rate or your profit contribution won, uh, the potential marketing costs you see. So we need to have very fast certain comfort that you can make money with the business. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a tangible way to make money with the business. So we would never start a business where we say, okay, it, it sounds like innovative, but we will figure out later how to make money. That's why I probably would have never invested in, in Twitter or something. Um, unfortunately, perhaps. <laughs> um, um, I think that's, that's number one. Number two is just to see proof that it can scale. Because um, I also believe that everybody should always try to play his or her strength. And one of our strengths is to build processes in companies that are ready for scale, so rather than niche models. So if those two elements are um, um, basically tick marked, we already look at something much more carefully. Mm -hmm. And then we would look at um, proof of having sufficient investor interest in, in, in a business and then at market opportunities. So if something is super, super interesting, unit economics are great, uh, all investors want to invest in it, but it's already extremely competitive, we also stay away from right. it. Um, and you know, these would be, let's say, the four key check, check boxes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, just w w one more for me for the moment. Um, again, uh, building businesses, it's, uh, it's, it's about those factors, but it's also about the people. Um, w w what are the things that uh, you assess uh, when hiring people that you've found have been uh, very successful, the best predictors of people that will perform when building these businesses? Again, good question. So um, it's not always easy. It's not easy, no, uh, of course. <laughs> but, um, you know, first, I think you need to understand, and also, let's say, the people who work for us need to understand uh, our value proposition. Right. So, you know, I always try to explain it to people that we are somewhere between, let's say, the McKinsey and the 100% entrepreneur world. So, you don't get 100% equity and 100% upside, right. but you also don't have you also don't have a corporate corporate job. You um, get a lot of freedom and a lot of freedom to operate, but still uh, we believe in processes and certain boundaries and certain, uh, you know, at least elements where we think 
whatever checklist processes uh, mentoring uh, helps you and that's why also our value proposition for founders because we we call them founders and we also believe they are founders but in the end it's something a bit in between where we say you know you have a backer like rocket from day one you have somebody who already contributes a significant amount of money to the business which is factor 10 of a typical angel investment but of course in return we also expect from you um you know, uh, you know that that you that you um, listen what what we are what we are saying that you l look at our uh, expertise and, and take it take it uh, from it. So I think one of the one of the key elements for me is that basically there is not a misunderstanding uh, on the role from from day one, and the the interest is aligned uh, very early. Um, we like to to hire people who already have experience in uh, you know working for startups or working in a very uh, you know, focused and strategically driven environment. Uh, sometimes it's also uh, ex-consultants that have proven uh, that they are say, very smart and smart thinkers and then are looking for this execution part. Um, and, and then I think uh, something that also has changed over the past years, that we believe very much in the strength of local talent and people uh, you know, with, the, with the knowledge of the local uh, marketplace feels funny that a German who works for Rocket in Singapore is, is saying that, but I am probably, I think, one of the last or the last German uh, in, in our organization now because we try to uh, work with people who also really understand the local customers. Okay, so if you're localizing, you're hiring at the moment? Um, uh, yes, we are always hiring. Always hiring. We're always hiring. <laughs> okay. <laughs> On that note, not uh, people asking for jobs, but if uh, people would um, have some questions. Uh, where's the first question? There's a microphone. Coming your way. Hi, my name is Vishal Gupta. So my question is, uh, from all your investments, there would be some which were not successful, right? So what were those and what did you learn from them or what went wrong, which is a good lesson for everybody else? So again, in the end, probably it's always individual stories. I think every venture has a certain journey and has a story to tell. Um, and, and of course, you know, we are we are uh, not always successful. Uh, we are in a super super risky business of being such an early investor and incubator. So um, we have probably a very similar success ratio than a typical uh, venture capitalist uh, has as well. Um, perhaps to pick just a couple of examples. So you probably also know that we started a company here, Easy Taxi. Uh, we were starting Easy Taxi before Grab, before Uber. A taxi ride right hailing app without without let's say I mean only focusing on taxis professional taxis but that was kind of also the start of a lot of other companies and uh, we decided to sh shut down first because we saw the um, you know competitive market suddenly changing so our expectation was that we would be uh, let's say the only ones in this market for quite some time we could have long time to work with the local taxi companies to basically aggregate all the supply and work on the demand and suddenly we had uber and grab um, throwing around with discounts so in the end we had to change our perspective on the attractiveness of of this spe spe specific sector quite a lot and just had to take a decision on capital allocation. Um, and then perhaps also fits to, to, to the easy taxi uh, example. Uh, we were doing and building the business in parallel in uh, Southeast Asia and in Latin America. Um, the tech was based in Latin America and that's why also the product was very much focusing on the needs of the uh, Latin Amer American markets and then, you know, our our ability to just uh, roll something out fast uh, came to some uh, some yeah some 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 point where, where it didn't work for for the Asian markets and then uh, uh, in addition with the competitive environment um, it didn't it didn't work so I think a good example of of something where competitive environment may change um, and also you need to focus and you shouldn't sometimes do too many markets and too many countries at once if you then cannot really deliver uh, what the local market needs and you develop a product that not fits uh, the customer needs. Another question? Oh, we've got two over here. Hi, uh, Andre. Um, let me try to extract some free advice from you if I can. Some of us in the room are actually brand marketers 
or brand consultants and not high growth or marketplace builders. If you were introducing, let's say, a consumer brand uh, into a new emerging market, e-commerce enabled, they want to be a player in, in e-commerce, what, what would we look out for? What are the, the big things that we need to look out for in these markets uh, from that perspective? Probably, unfortunately, I can give you only a bit of generic, uh, generic advice. I, I, I fear, but um, you know, I think what what we definitely learned is that you cannot spend too little time with really understanding your consumer and your target consumer. So I think uh, also when when you mentioned um, failures, I think they didn't uh, work well. I think um, you need to spend a lot of time to really understanding the exact situation and the exact preferences um, your local customer is in to, to, to be successful. Um, uh, you know, and, and, and I think we all need to accept first that you, you shouldn't view the world, especially not the Southeast Asian world, uh, with only, let's say, observing what we see in Singapore and trying to transport that to Myanmar or to Bangladesh, because countries are so different, infrastructure is different, religions are different, cultures are different, so all aspects are different. And that is why I think to, to be very, very strong on the ground, to, to, to understand the country, the co consumer first, is, is extremely important. Um, I think it's important uh, also to try to be loud and bold, um, um, especially if it's something completely new um, and it requires um, uh, let's say education to some extent. Um, so I think it's important then that you also not only focus on perhaps your brand, but you also focus very much on the usage of the product. So this this example of uh, you know us introducing e-commerce in some of the markets, um, we for example discovered that people were just just I mean per the first they haven't understand uh, or haven't heard about the brand say Daras, uh, for example. But secondly, they also have never gone through a shopping process online, check out, order, enter your address. So you just need to explain that to them. And perhaps they even never heard that you can return something if you don't like it. Um, so it's really, really about not only you tell everyone, oh, Daras e-commerce, but you even explain the people what you can do with it and why it's good. Um, and this especially from a marketing perspective, is much more difficult because you, let's say in classical mass marketing, you have perhaps one or two messages that you can uh, convey, but not a whole story and a whole explanation. But then sometimes it requires local influencers or even people you know, going from home to home or from community to community to explain that to people. And that worked pretty well for us. And then to try to um, focus on you know, this kind of whatever uh, you know, uh, chain effect that you talk to uh, key influencers, incentivize them to speak to their friends, to give them, for example, a tablet, to then go to their friends to order something together, um, that they can go to their friends and order something together. Uh, these kind of things uh, worked quite well for us. Uh, just in the middle here, there was one. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned uh, that you avoid making the same mistakes again, um, given that Rocket has so many different companies in so many different countries serving so many different verticals. How do you actually go about this? How do you avoid making the same mistakes? So I, I hope I said I, we try to. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the simple answer is just about talking to each other and building this internal network and, and ecosystem. Um, so. You know, I think we can still improve our knowledge management, but of course we try to still to absorb, uh, absorb a lot of the learnings uh, in the headquarter, build checklists, build guidelines, build processes that we can then share with everyone. Um, we try to gather our founders um, very actively. So for example, if you uh, also think about uh, helping, for example, the founders in all the different countries uh, are in regular contact or they do meetings to exchange information, exchange best practices. Um, so I think it's all about, you know, this kind of knowledge sharing and trying to create a culture where, you know, people exchange this information. Um, but ha also having said that, 
uh, it's still one of the, the biggest areas for improvement uh, uh, of us because um, we are sometimes a bit in the middle uh, or let's say in a, in, a, in, a, in a challenging situation, let me put it like this, because on the one hand we want to build independent companies and on the other hand we have this idea of exchanging information and at some point uh, it's a conflict of interest. Um, so we try to do it, let's say, as closely as we can do, especially in the first year. Uh, when we are also extremely involved and extremely hands-on also with just exchanging people, exchanging processes, and exchanging documentation. Uh, also, uh, uh, one of my role is just to tell people um, you know, that I don't know the answer, but I know they could, who, who, who they could contact to, to, to find the answer. Um, but at some point in time, um, uh, you know, there, there may be a conflict when people then want, need to go on their own and companies need to go on their own and Lazada then is acquired by Alibaba and is still kind of part of the family, but is, uh, you know, uh, married to this rich Chinese guy. So, <laughs> Did you draw on some of your BCG past experience and that sort of knowledge sharing? I mean, management consultants are very good yeah. at consolidating information from past experiences. You're, you're right, and um, I wish we would have had such a fancy system at Rocket that uh, as we had at BCG, yeah. because uh, there we had a very, very kind of advanced online sharing platform. Also, you know, very strong incentives for people to share knowledge. Uh, so I think extremely well done. Um, and then to replicate that um, um, for Rocket, it's not uh, it's not so easy. Yeah. We are trying to go in this direction, but you're right. It's um, it's uh, an interesting element for, for best well, practices. I can remember the old days we were working with uh, McKinsey, and overnight the amount of documentation uh, that was faxed. Now, it was faxed in those days when I was doing it, but you'd wake up in the morning, come into the office, and literally there were documents from every other telco that they worked on around the world that uh, was there. There was a gentleman over in the back. Hello. Hi, uh, Francis from Unilever. I have a question for a company that, like Rocket, where 99% is all the execution, right? Execution of excellence. Um, the differentiation of your platform then goes down to like these last mile things or customer service or being first. What happens when there's a bigger player that comes in and, then, and, and they've got that execution of excellence too or they've got um, funding from outside the country and flooding the market with, uh, with promos or codes? Do you get into that fight? If you do, how do you handle that? Uh, I think ex excellent point because sometimes we don't. Uh, so, for example, Easy Taxi was an excellent, let's say, example where we had to, you know, review our competitive positioning and we had to be honest with ourselves and say, okay, come on, actually, um, in this execution phase, we were not able to build such a localized product that had an edge. Um, we did not collect that amount of money um, and also didn't believe that it would be, let's say, return value to our shareholders to go into this fight. So in this case, we decided, let's go out of this fight and focus resources somewhere else. Um, I would, however, argue that in a lot of other situations, um, there's still two very attractive, or there are two, two attractive possibilities. I think number one is, um, you know, the 99.1% is, of course, uh, you know, a bit uh, bold as a, as a statement, I would still hope that while we do the execution, we learn so much about our consumers, about, uh, you know, what the consumer really needs, that also a Lazada, for example, looks very different and is very differently structured than just being a copy uh, of Amazon that only does the last mile a bit differently. So that is why I think in this process of then becoming also an independent company, um, uh, I would still always argue that our companies are very innovative and really build something that's unique, that perhaps only takes this idea piece of say, oh, we do e-commerce, or we want to be a marketplace for um, helpers. But then say how they do it, which is in the end the whole execution, which is the whole customer experience, the whole product, every process is unique and is very innovative. So either this is the case and I'm right with this and then we don't fear an entrant uh, and, and, and a new competitor or, and perhaps you know, the Alibaba could be uh, an example for this, uh, we could even tell a st big strategic entrant that we are a very good partner uh, for them so that they uh, better comp not compete but rather uh, you know, become a partner in the company. Okay, we, uh, we've got two questions on this side of the room. 
We'll just see how we're going for timing. We started a bit late. Sir. How do you leverage uh, partnerships with telecoms at Rocket Asia? Um, so, let's say, uh, many ways in different ways. So, for example, um, one of our investors in, in this fund is, is um, Oridu. It's a big uh, Middle Eastern telecommunication company that also owns Indosat or the majority stake in Indosat. And then, of course, um, we are you know, speaking with the Indosat team on a, on a weekly basis to see you know, what kind of synergies can we create? Can we, for example, do marketing for our products through Indosat? Can we offer certain discounts or certain uh, exclusive deals and packages to Indosat customers um, and tap into the fact that they have 80 million customers in the country um, to access, you know, whatever, th their telephone numbers, to get promotions um, out and you know, leverage these kind of marketing uh, activities. So I think that's area number one. So to the extent possible, and of course we don't want to spam anybody and there's also, you know, you cannot just exchange data freely, but we create exclusive offers, which in the end is a win-win for both. So Indosat can go to their customers and say, okay, because I'm invested in this, I have an exclusive offer that you cannot get if you are an Excel uh, customer. Um, and I think number two is uh, very much on payment. You know, a lot of the uh, companies, telecommunication companies, invest into payment a lot. Um, they have also a billing relationship with their consumers. So we are now exploring different ways and already doing that, for example, with Zen Rooms, where you can pay with your, um, you know, with, a, with, a, with, a, with your um, Oridu or Indosat um, wallet, you can pay your hotel booking and things like that. So these are the most um, uh, interesting elements. Um, and we're doing that both in Myanmar and in, in Indonesia with them quite closely. Gentleman behind. Hello. Okay. There you go. Um, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I'm Evan. I'm working at a startup that's built a data platform for other startups. Um, so I guess in, uh, for startups, we're very much obsessed with the idea of product market fit. Right. So we're always trying to find ways to uh, refine the product and learn more about the market. Um, so I'm just curious to hear from you. Um, is there a moment when you know that this model or this product is going to be able to scale? Do you look at the data or what is it that makes you realize, okay, I think we've got it. This thing is going to grow and take off. So we are looking at the data a lot. So we're spending a lot of time, uh, and uh, yeah, a lot of our time we spend with data, looking at comparables, looking at you know, how a certain company performs compared to our expectations, but also compared to, to, to other companies. So yes, that is, that is, that is uh, completely correct. Um, on the other hand, every company is different, every market environment is different, and every product is also a bit different. So um, we try to do something like a healthy mixture between, you know, having a certain goal, a certain initial business plan, and certain benchmarks, um, and then, you know, having a mostly quarterly review rhythm um, where we really, you know, basically test this company um, and the performance of the company against what we expect. Um, I would still have to admit the real, let's say, decision, so to speak, whether we want to double down on investments or whether we think it's not working is still something that is very, let's say, it's supported by data, but it's not entirely data driven. Uh, otherwise, there would really be something like a secret source and secret code, and unfortunately, even we don't have it. And otherwise, we also wouldn't, wouldn't fail. So it's still too complex to only look at data, but I think uh, a big advantage we have is that we have a lot of data points from different companies around the world that we can benchmark us against. Okay, let's, uh, well, there's still m many more questions, but uh, how is your time? I know you. Okay, I, I, I'm going to take two more questions and then I'll let you break and then you can uh, ask questions uh, uh, together. So, uh, no, it was down here. No, I, I had um, um, Mike, did you have a question? Or this lady? Um, thanks for the presentation and thanks for the mic. My name is Hannah, I'm from BP. So my question is just based on your presentation and what 
we've been hearing about rocket internet strategy, you are very much focusing on you know, developing markets, especially in Southeast Asia. Is there any reason why you're not looking as much into Northeast Asia markets, like Korea, Japan, China, et cetera? Because I was just looking at um, your slides about challenges of your business, you know, like infrastructure awareness, talent, all that. It's all there in those markets. So it must be a lot easier for you to venture. So wondering what the reason is. Good, exactly. No, no, I think excellent, excellent question. So, um, so two, two, two parts of, of the answer. I think first element is, I mean, we like these challenges. So we, we like, so we, I believe, that if we go to a market where you have these challenges, it's perhaps more difficult to succeed, yes, but if you succeed, you can also create more value. That's why I think it's a big, so if you tell me, for example, okay, China, you have a whole infrastructure, but that also makes China a very competitive market. Areas uh, or barriers to entry are lower if you only look at uh, this factor, for example, um, and that's why uh, I would rather stay away from it than rather saying, okay, I want to be the next one in the market. So uh, I would really say um, some of the challenges for us are really opportunities to be successful rather than something that scares us away. Um, on China, um, especially on China, but also applies for, for Japan and Korea um, 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 very, very, uh, in a very similar way, our, uh, to be fair, our big problem is that we don't understand the market well enough. So, um, on, on, I mean, you, you all know uh, Japan and Korea, uh, for example, are both markets that are very, very local. So you need to be extremely smart to understand the local consumers. And we have, in the past, not been really able to, perhaps because of lack of focus, um, perhaps before because of just other opportunities we, 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 we focused on to get you know, the talent and the knowledge to succeed on those markets. Um, and for China, we just said, okay, we are the small guys. We are, even Rocket is too small to succeed uh, in, in, in China. Um, um, some of the big players uh, are, s you know, even, even compared to us, so much magnitude better funded, know the market much better, barriers for, uh, for entry are low, competition is high, why should we, we should we go there? And then you know sometimes marketing also plays plays a part. When Rocket uh, went public, uh, also our my friends from from the finance team had to think about a marketing plan how to market the Rocket share. And I think their brilliant and smart idea was to say, come on, if you want to invest into a digital company that's not in China and not in the U.S., invest in Rocket. And that's why I'm not allowed to go to China. <laughs> but kind of an interesting idea, big problems, but not big competitors. Uh, so it's kind of nice. Now, I think there was one uh, down the back. Yeah. Th this will actually be the last question, and then we'll uh, get on with uh, general networking. Yeah, you mentioned you do businesses in different developing countries, developed countries, and even pioneer like the Pakistan. How do you go about getting the trust of the businesses to uh, use your service and stuff like that? Was it the same approach for different part, different countries, or is it the same? Um, it's probably wrong to say it's the same, and the local teams will probably tell you, Hannah, you're completely wrong when you say it's the same. But broadly, um, it's similar because it's about uh, you know it's about building a brand, and building brand also always means creating trust. Um, creating trust, you can. Uh, only create by creating a customer experience that is in line with your value proposition or with your promise. Um, and then it turns uh, in the end out to things like, um, you know, ensuring the quality of your, of your product is, is good, ensuring if you have a complaint, you have a functioning uh, customer service, uh, that especially in the early stages, in the early uh, time, you are very generous also with your customer service and you accept if somebody is not happy and you, you know, basically rather create people who promote uh, your, your, your product and speak good of it rather than telling, okay, I had this terrible experience and I, don't do, I will not use the platform again and about creating awareness. Um, and then, of course, sometimes it helps to... Uh, really understand what drives the trust of the consumer and the local the local people. That's why being as local as possible while still uh, leveraging on 
central processes as much as possible is kind of the, the magic in the end behind it. Okay, Th thank you very much for being so open and such great insights. I think I've, I've learned a lot. So please join with me in, in thanking Hanai for such a great presentation. <laughs> so hang around uh, and uh, you're here for a few more yep, minutes. Yep, Can take a few more questions if you were a bit shy or I didn't get to you. Um, thanks again. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.